Can I get you to introduce yourself, please? Yes, my name is Tina Renshaw, and I'm the Chief Executive of the English Speaking Board, International Limited, to give us our full title. What do you do, Can it in short? Yes, so we are an awarding body. So what that means is we write uh, assessments, examinations in the old language, uh, and we look at two areas. We look at speaking and listening skills, and we look at English language skills. So we write those assessments, we mark them, and we certificate them. What do the examinations do? Do they get you into universities? Do they, how does it help? And also, can people from outside the UK take part in your examinations? Absolutely. Well, even though that's what we do, we don't think that really that's just the point of coming to study with us because it's it's the act of actually acquiring the skills and the knowledge that are lifetime skills, whether that's speaking and listening, which we're now calling oracy, or whether that's English language skills. So uh, our, we are an off-call regulated awarding body. So that means that our qualifications are accredited. So for example, if you take some of our qualifications that you can do, uh, most often are done say at post 16, they are a level where you can get UCAS points. They're the points that uh, learners can use to be recognized to go to university, for example. So yes, all of our qualifications amount to something. And most reports from employer organizations, communication skills are one of those things that employers would really like us to prepare young people better for so that they're work ready with their ability to work with each other, to negotiate, to communicate, to listen, um, because that's so critical to the world of work for every job. Myself, I've had a speech impediment due to my dyslexia, and it's always caused a bit of an issue, particularly having a Scouse accent. But I have had voice training and a bit of voice coaching and a bit of speech for therapy. With lockdown, there's been no interaction properly with kids in many places, and that has impacted heavily on the ability to communicate for a lot of kids. What is your organisation doing currently? You're absolutely right. Um, so many of us who are involved with young people, whether that's young people in schools and colleges, or also we work with young people in, in charities such as Reclaim in Moss Side. The impact of not being able to get together, not to be able to speak informally as well as formally, really has had an impact. And, and we know, for example, even before lockdown happened, that if you're... Um, children with poor vocabulary at the age of five, they're twice as likely to be unemployed when the, by the time they reach 34 as they're more affluent uh, children and peers. So the ability to communicate is absolutely central. So what have we been doing? We've been really launching this campaign. This, uh, we're launching a campaign that celebrates our 70th anniversary as English Speaking Board. But we're not just being introspective. We're saying what we want to do is reach more organizations to help them equip their young people, their children and adults with the speaking and listening and the English language skills they need to succeed. So that's our response in these difficult times to say, we're hoping to be able to financially support organizations who might not be able to easily afford to do our qualifications. And we're interested in not just schools and colleges, but also a charitable groups who work with adults, young people. I've just been recently talking to an organization who work with uh, adults who've got acquired brain injuries. And so there's a real range of people who can benefit from having confidence building as you yourself have described. If maybe you have a learning disability, a speech impediment, the confidence that you can gain by having a focus and an opportunity to practice these skills is an absolutely lifelong skill. And we'd love to offer that to more people. Do you think the Americanization of the English language online is also now heavily affecting the way we speak and the way children and young people communicate now. Well, when we're looking at our speaking and listening uh, assessments, it's really about the ability to be heard and to listen. So as long as the language you choose, the accent you have, doesn't impede anybody talking to you. That's really what's more important to us. Um, obviously, there's a, a range of um, new vocabulary that may be difficult for other people to, to understand. So we do ask our learners to be aware of that, to say that they can speak in their natural way. They don't have to posh their accent up like I did, or like you did by the sounds of it, 
they can speak as, as long as it allows other people to engage with them and to be able to understand them. So it's not really a case for us of Americanization or anything like that about language. It's about encouraging young people to know if it was a formal audience, what sort of language should you use? If it was an informal conversation with their peers, could they use different language? So it's about us giving them the tools for the right time and the right place. What type of places can you actually get access to your courses through apart from online? Okay, so on our website, you can, any organization can become a center. That's the language that we use. So they can um, register with us and we check out that as an organization, they've got some people who've got the skills to train their children or young people or adults in these English language or speaking and listening skills. And we support them by training them. And then when they're ready, they book to have our specialized assessors come out and actually listen to them. So we do this, you asked me before, is it just this country or internationally? No, we offer our qualifications internationally. We have thousands of young people just next weekend taking our language qualifications in Greece, for example. And we have hundreds of learners every week taking them in Italy. So we're all over the world uh, with our qualifications too. How has COVID restrictions affected the, your ability for the people taking your courses to access? Has it made it easier or harder? Look, we're really flexible. And uh, our regulator, Ofpol, ensured that we could, where our learners wanted to take their assessments, they could. So we've been using this technology. And of course, as the um, students, particularly in schools and colleges, have become more familiar, more used to their learning happening through this technology, then we've also been assessing through this technology, whether it's live like this, or for some of our learners, they've recorded it and we've assessed it. So we've done our absolute best that if our organisations, our centres are ready and want to do our assessments, then we were there for them. Talking online to a lot of people, uh, one of the things I always amuses me highly is the difference in the UK of so many different languages, uh, well, variations of the English language, I should say, with accents, say like Scouse in Liverpool, then up the road you've got Manchester with Mancunian, and then a couple of metres down the road you've got Lancashire, you've got it. All this huge difference in language and the way we speak in the UK. And when you're talking to an American, they think you speak the Queen's English. And then when they hear you, they just don't know what to say. And how different uh, is the way you teach that allows people to listen to different accents? And how do you get around that? Um, I think we don't deal with that head on. I mean, it's an interesting question. But that's not really our bucket of what we focus on. What we are enabling children and young people to do is to have the skills to communicate and to listen. So we don't ask them to speak in a particular way. We don't ask them to have long vowels like I've got now. They can have short ones, they can have accents. Anything is great because it's about communicating. So as long as your vocabulary and your accent don't impede on somebody listening, um, then we're not assessing that in a negative way. So we don't really tackle the question that you're asking, but it's certainly an interesting one. What types of things do you find are the most common problems for people with English language? Looking at English language, if they're coming from a different country, um, obviously it's that balance between finding the right vocabulary for everyday life and then also having the knowledge of more formal types of English so that they can write in a language that isn't their first language. They can listen uh, to a lot of information. So just those general uh, language skills that we all might have come across when we were at school and we were asked to, to learn a different language. So we have different types of uh, English language qualifications. We have a, a type that lots of learners do in our colleges up and down the country called English uh, ESOL Skills for Life, which is about equipping people with the language they need for everyday life to become familiar with it where English isn't their first language. And then we have the English uh, for speakers of other languages called ESOL International. And that's for that more formal higher level study. And some of those learners study to a level equivalent to an A level. And again, they can get UCAS points for those qualifications. So we have a range of English language options to suit both newly visiting uh, migrants to this country, supporting them with their integration and their development and their ability to be employed and really uh, be cohesive members of, of the UK, as well as young people who might want to come and study in the UK or just feel that possessing English 
at a higher level is really going to be great for their future. What do you offer for people in the UK as well? Uh, as for example, do you offer a drama stylization of the course or do you, what types of th varieties and things do you do and how do you actually implement the course? So with the assessments that we have are um, about speaking and listening, that's the mainstay, that's the thing that Christabel Bernstein uh, created 70 years ago. So it's an assessment of an individual in a small group of learners, whether you're from year one at school all the way up to uh, year 13, if you stay at school or in college. And uh, that's where you can spend some time talking about something that interests you. You can read from a book and explain why that's fascinating to you. You can talk about a piece of innovation or IT, or you can talk about a, a piece in the media. So there's all sorts of ways of engaging our young people at the moment in this country. We also look at assessing debating skills. So that formal skills of debating, maybe so that you're prepared if you want to be a member of parliament or just understand what it's like to take part in a formal debate. We also have opportunities to do group speaking. So sometimes learners are a bit nervous about being the only person to speak. So they can be assessed in a group, a big group of, of uh, their peers at school and they can do things together and assessor comes in. So we're all about assessments. We don't teach the programs. We write the assessments and it's our organisations that we work with, our centres, they're the people who are responsible for actually then deciding to teach a programme to support that skill development. Who is your underwriter of your qualification? Are you the underwriter of the qualification or, or do you have a, a university that underwrites it? So we are the awarding organisation. So because we're regulated by Ofqual, um, we have the responsibility to write the qualifications and we have to ensure that the standards of our qualifications meet what Ofqual requires, just like any other awarding body, like the ones who write GCSEs and A-levels and BTECs and the T-levels. We're regulated by that, that same uh, regulator, which is Ofqual. What do you think is going to be your next step as an organisation? Where do you think you're going? Well, it's all about our 7070 campaign. We're so focused on making sure that we can reach a wider audience of organizations, adults, children, young people who might feel that they didn't know about us, for example, um, or who feel that maybe they weren't aware of just how much that we could help them to develop those skills in English language or speaking and listening. So we are really focusing on spreading that message. So thank you very much for taking the time to ask me these questions so that we can get more people to know all about the English Speaking Board and how we can build confidence because at the heart of what we do was uh, a view from two fantastic ladies in the 50s in Southport talk about entrepreneurs who decided that they were gonna create this thing Called the English Speaking Board because they believed that at the heart of human relationships was our ability to speak and listen to each other and so that's what we still do 70 years later we think that in the time we've just been through it's needed even more there's even the parliamentarians now we've, there's just been an all-party parliamentary group on oracy which is the posh term for speaking and listening so even the parliamentarians now know about the work that we do and other organizations like us so we think it's really important we keep going and we reach out to as many people as we can through our 7070 campaign. Now you just mentioned the word Southport, or mm -hmm. say our town Southport. What is the connection and how did it actually become a national organisation? As I said, two amazing women who were originally, so it's Christabel Berniston and Jocelyn Bell, who in the 50s were based in Southport and they ran uh, their own school of speech and drama. And from looking at that more performance-based uh, speech and drama, they also realised that things like elocution, thinking back in the 50s now, really weren't what we needed. And what we needed was the understanding that speaking and listening is about connecting with people. And every job that you will ever do, every course that you will ever study, requires you to have both of those skills. And if we provide people with the opportunities to develop the skills and the understanding of how to speak audibly, clearly, to ask questions, to show interest, to challenge, to analyze. If we give people those skills and then the skills to listen, to listen actively with curiosity, to ask really great open penetrating questions that get a great dialogue going, then who wouldn't say no to having any of those skills? So they built this organization. They created a fantastic team of assessors who would travel the country and the world 
uh, English speaking board has been in so many countries across the world from Australia, where I'm also from, um, all the way through to, to the Far East. We currently are in Singapore. Uh, we're currently in China, Greece, Italy, all sorts of places all over the world. Um, and it's still going because I think what they set up was about that personal connection with these fantastic expert assessors that we have who travel the country, providing their feedback to children, young people and adults. So this isn't just about a grade, what we do. This is about every learner that we assess gets personal feedback to say, well done you. This is what you did that was fantastic. Let's talk about the things that you can do even better and focus on next time. So it's about confidence building because if you allow a young person to know that they have a right to be heard and the tools of how to express themselves, then the future is really bright. I know that sounds a bit hackneyed, but I really believe that it's true. Do you think there's a lot of communication now in families as well, thanks to the advent of social media? Do you think that's also affecting the way we communicate and the way we have the ability to talk to others and listen and work out what other people are saying? I think one of the things that, that we're recognizing about social media is if you think about what I said about what we do, it's the speaking and the listening. And you could argue that with social media, there's a lot of output, maybe not a lot of listening. Um, and so I'd really like to, to support um, families, young people, everybody to think about the both aspects of what they do. But also, we don't just encourage young people just to say anything. The skills are about research, they're about analysis, they're about thinking, they're about different sides, different points of view. So we try and give them the skills to have balanced dialogue, even when they strongly disagree with people, but to have a balanced dialogue. And maybe sometimes our tools for social media aren't really focusing on that balanced dialogue. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, can I just finish off with, if anybody wants to find out any more information or take part in any of your courses, where can they go? Okay, they go to our website, which is www.esbuk.org. Then there's a contact right on the top page and they'll probably come through to me and I'd love to talk to you, anybody, and uh, listen to what your hopes and dreams are for ORC in English language and to see how we can help you. Thank you and good luck and congratulations on 70 years. Thank you very much indeed. Nice to speak with you and great listening too.